Whenever we see some wild stunt on the big screen, we know that it was either done through CGI or, when done practically, there were probably safety people on set, or at least safety precautions were taken. Or we would like to think that. That, unfortunately, isn't always the case and there are a lot of movies, some of which have been very successful, that left their actors physically worse off than when they started. In this video, I want to take a look at the movies that pushed their actors to the physical limits and, in most cases, injured them severely. A lot of these were stunts gone wrong, but a couple were entirely self-inflicted. The Wizard of Oz is one of the brightest movies ever made. I mean, come on, the movie has literal frolicking. But all that sunshine is hiding perhaps some of the darkest behind-the-scenes stories in Hollywood history. Several actors suffered serious injuries, while the lead actress, Judy Garland, was so abused that it might as well qualify as a lifelong debilitation. I think that the Wicked Witch of the West, played by Margaret Hamilton, and her stunt double, Betty Danko, got the worst of it. Towards the beginning of the Oz scenes, the Wicked Witch appears and leaves in a puff of smoke. Seems like a nice effect, right? Unfortunately, one of the stunts went wrong. Horribly, horribly wrong. During the exit scene, there's a trap door that Hamilton was supposed to go through when the pyrotechnics went off. But the trap door's drop was delayed, so Hamilton ended up bearing the full brunt of the pyro. She suffered second degree burns to her face and third degree burns to her hand. In the making of The Wizard of Oz, author Algene Hermits described it in detail, quote, The flames had jumped from the broom straw, scalding her chin, the bridge of her nose, her right cheek, and the right side of her forehead. The eyelashes and eyebrow on her right eye had been burned off. Her upper lip and eyelid were badly burned, end quote. It was as though her nerves were fried because she didn't feel any pain, just warmth. She only saw how bad it was when she saw her right hand, quote, From the wrist to the fingernails, there was no skin on the hand. It was as though someone had taken the top of her hand and peeled it like an orange, end quote. When the doctor began applying antiseptic alcohol to the wounds, quote, Margaret Hamilton did not scream. Screaming was not an appropriate activity for privately educated Midwestern gentlewomen, end quote. But she later said that she would, quote, never, as long as I live, have anything that took my breath away like that pain, end quote. Hamilton had to take six weeks off of filming. It was down to the nerves. When Victor Fleming later shook her hand, she almost fainted from the pain. He was squeezing a bundle of exposed nerves, after all. If an accident like this happened now, the actor in question would immediately sue. But during this era, when the studio system was in full effect, the actor had virtually zero power. Hamilton did not sue because, if she did, she wouldn't work in the town again. She would have to wait decades before the full story would come out. Her stunt double, Betty Danko, didn't get off any easier. During the Surrender Dorothy skywriting scene, Danko had to sit on a pipe made to resemble her broom. The pipe exploded while she was suspended in midair, so not only did she have to worry about the fire, she had to worry about falling down more than a dozen feet. In her words, quote, I felt as though my scalp was coming off. I guess that's because my hat and black wig were torn loose. They found them days later at the top of the stage. The explosion blew me off the broomstick. I managed to grab it with both hands and throw my leg over it. I hung upside down while the men handling the wires lowered the broomstick to the floor and put me face down on the stage, end quote. The accident resulted in permanent scarring on Danko's legs. She was in the hospital for 11 days. Then there's the Tin Man. The man who plays the Tin Man, Jack Haley, was actually a replacement. The actor that was first cast in the role was Buddy Ebsen. But Ebsen had a severe allergic reaction to the Tin Man makeup. Aluminum powder was mixed in to give the makeup its silver sheen and, unfortunately for Ebsen, quite a bit of it got into his lungs. It was enough to cause a severe allergic reaction that left him feeling as though he was unable to breathe for days. Haley, his replacement, fared no better. The makeup was altered to make it a form of paste, but it ended up getting into his eyes, which caused an eye infection that required surgery in order to avoid permanent damage. And then there's Judy Garland. Garland did not suffer a particular injury so much as she suffered a long train of abuses. As I mentioned earlier, the studio system was in full effect. Actors would sign long-term contracts with studios that basically made them indentured servants. They would work for that studio, MGM in this case, and no one else until they were loaned out. While working there, the actor or actress in question had no power and no method to fight against the studio. They could just as easily not use them in any movie, effectively ending their career, which is what happened with Tippi Hedren and Alfred Hitchcock. 
Garland was just 16 when she was cast as Dorothy. The hours were long, the snow was asbestos, and the diet the studio kept Garland on in order for her to retain her looks consisted of chicken soup, black coffee, and cigarettes. And to make sure that she wouldn't doze off during the long, arduous shoots, she was given stimulants to keep her awake, which likely led to her forming a crippling addiction that would haunt her for the rest of her life. In addition to the continual criticism from adults who ought to have had her interests at heart, pressure from her family, and more, what should have been a joyous experience ended up casting a long pall over her life instead. She would die of a drug overdose on June 22, 1969. The Wizard of Oz is an iconic and, yes, wonderful film that's endlessly rewatchable. One just wishes that it wasn't made under such conditions. The Exorcist is famous for having a curse that was, more or less, a marketing push by director William Friedkin and the studio. His previous film was The French Connection and is considered one of the best movies ever made. Friedkin would replicate that success with The Exorcist, starring Ellen Burstyn, Linda Blair, and Max von Sydow. Considered one of the best horror films ever made, the movie also has two of the most horrific behind-the-scenes incidents. And I'm not talking about the carpenter that lost part of his thumb, or the lighting technician that lost a toe. Nor am I talking about the pigeon that offed itself by flying into a circuit breaker that then lit the house set on fire. Nor am I talking about the multiple deaths that occurred during filming. Look, over a 200 day shoot that was supposed to be less than 90 days, you're gonna have some people, unfortunately, lose their lives. Jim McDermott, writing for American Magazine, recapped some of the deaths. Quote, a certain anxiety proved contagious too. A number of people connected with the film died during production, among them Jack McCowan, the night watchman, the person responsible for the set refrigeration, the newborn baby of the assistant cameraman, cast member Max von Sydow's brother, and cast member Linda Blair's grandfather. The son of another cast member, Jason Miller, was also hit by a motorcyclist on an empty beach and almost died." End quote. But there were two life-changing accidents that occurred as a result of nothing more than William Friedkin's hard driving and dismissal of safety concerns. Each had to do with spinal injuries suffered by the lead actresses Ellen Burstyn and Linda Blair. Linda Blair, just 13 at the time, played Regan McNeil, the possessed. And at such a young age, she suffered an injury and aversion that continues to haunt her. In one of the possession scenes that actually made it into the film, Blair was improperly strapped to a bed that would shake mechanically. The bed shook so violently that when it rocketed Blair up, she fractured her spine. Her screams of pain aren't fake, they're quite real. Unfortunately, it wasn't just something she could bounce back from. The injury developed into scoliosis, which has left her in chronic pain for years. In Blair's words, quote, I had a lot of difficulty living with the aftermath of the exorcist. The back injury was far more serious than I ever imagined and really affected my health negatively for a long time, end quote. And because Friedkin wanted everyone entering the bedroom set to really feel the chill, he had it so the room was constantly kept at zero degrees to 20 below zero. But whereas others could wear warmer clothes, Blair could not. Her character was in a thin nightgown for the movie, and the time she spent there led to a lifelong disdain for the cold. Add to that the fact that she would spend as much as two hours a day for makeup that would burn her face, and one marvels at how she made it through the shoot at all. Ellen Burstyn, who played her mother, Chris McNeil, did not fare much better. There's one scene where Burstyn is thrown backwards by Regan, hits the ground, and screams in pain. As was the case for Blair, those screams of pain were real. To get the effect, she was in a harness that she complained was pulling too hard and had no padding either on herself or on the floor to cushion the blow. When Friedkin called action, the harness operator pulled hard. Burstyn hit the floor and fractured her tailbone, suffering a permanent spinal injury that also put her on crutches for the rest of the shoot. According to her, Friedkin never apologized. Jackie Chan has healed from more accidents than most people have suffered. You could do a long video on just the injuries that he sustained over his storied career. Before I get to the big one, here's a smattering. He nearly lost an eye after taking a high kick to the head on Drunken Master. He also suffered severe burns after falling onto hot coals during the movie. He broke his ankle on Rumble in the Bronx. He had his leg caught between two cars in Crime Story. He had a tooth knocked out on Snake in the Eagle's Shadow. He dislocated a shoulder on City Hunter. He injured his neck and broke his nose and some fingers when he fell from the clock tower in Project A. He almost suffocated during a throat injury on the young master. In Armor of God 2, Operation Condor, he dislocated his sternum. In Police Story 3, he suffered a broken cheekbone and a severe shoulder injury. And some of his worst injuries came from the first police story. During the pulse light scene, 
He suffered burns and electrical shocks as he went down the pole and then broke his 7th and 8th vertebrae when he went through the glass panes. All of that is to say that Jackie Chan should probably be a subject of study if you want to create an indestructible human. I don't know if he's made of adamantium, but he's certainly a cut above what the rest of us got. But those 10 injuries are just some of what he's endured over the 150 movies that he's been a part of, and there's a lot more. But the worst happened on 1986's Armor of God. On that movie, Chan sustained the injury that almost killed him. In one scene, Chan jumps onto a tree branch. He got a right on the first take, but while known as he is for being a perfectionist, he wanted another go around. The second take, everything went wrong. The tree branch broke when he grabbed it and he fell 15 feet. Unfortunately, during the fall, his head hit a rock and cracked his skull. A fragment of bone lodged itself in his brain and he needed to undergo an extensive brain surgery. Doctors filled in the hole with a plastic plug and Chan says that he can feel where his head was indented. He also suffered some hearing loss in his right ear. Keep in mind that this incident occurred in 1986 and that he's done more than 100 movies since then where he's gotten even more injuries. If nothing else, besides his movie hero, Buster Keaton, who did movies with a broken neck for several decades, there is no actor more resilient in film history and none as resilient alive. Shooting the abyss was such a bad experience for everyone involved, people started calling it the abuse. Filmed in a partially completed nuclear reactor, it's the movie that gave James Cameron his reputation as a hard driving director who would do whatever it took to get the right performance out of his actors. But the movie not only nearly cost Cameron his life, but had several cast and crew fearful that they wouldn't make it to the other side as well. Cameron's brush with death was the most harrowing. He nearly drowned after all. The crew had safety divers that they called angels, whose job it was to ensure the safety of the actors. Cameron, probably the most experienced driver amongst the cast, didn't have anyone watching him though. Unlike the rest of the cast and crew, he also wore some special equipment. 40 pound ankle weights and a 40 pound helmet that helped him walk along the bottom of the reactor. His oxygen tank allowed him 1 hour and 15 minutes worth of oxygen and, as he had a tendency to get lost in his work, his assistant director was in charge of keeping time. The AD was supposed to tell him when an hour had passed so that he could safely surface. One day, a couple of weeks into production, James Cameron took a breath and got no air. His AD forgot to give him the warning that he was out of oxygen. Through his helmet's mic, he tried to communicate with Al Giddings, his underwater director of photography, but Giddings was all but deaf in both ears. Cameron looked around to see if he could find someone to help him, but he was almost 40 feet deep with no lights. No one could see him. As a last ditch effort, he popped off his helmet and the buoyancy vest it was connected to and started to free ascent. According to his biography, The Futurist, quote, if a diver fails to breathe out during a free ascent, the compressed air in his lungs will expand as the pressure in the water around him decreases and eventually his lungs will explode." End quote. Cameron got a part of the way there when a safety diver noticed him and raced over to help. Then it got worse. The safety diver gave Cameron some air from his backup regulator. Cameron went through the procedure, purged the water and inhaled, but the regulator was broken. Instead of delivering air, it delivered water. Cameron thought he did it wrong, so he did it again and he got another blast of water delivered right inside of him. He was choking and his diver was trying to stop him from panicking by holding onto him. Cameron punched his diver and was able to make it to the surface. He would end up firing both the safety diver and his AD. James Cameron survived, perhaps to the chagrin of his cast and crew. To be sure, no part of filming The Abyss was easy. Actors Ed Harris and Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio both broke down. The former in tears and the latter had a physical and emotional breakdown. It's not hard to understand why. One scene had her being repeatedly slapped by Harris while soaking wet and just when they thought that they had a good take, it turned out that the camera ran out of film. She refused to do another take and Harris had to redo it without her. It's understandable, they were cold, tired, wet, beaten, and bruised. And according to Michael Bean, one day quote, suddenly the lights went out, it was so black I couldn't see my hand, I couldn't surface, I realized I might not get out of there, end quote. Basically, everyone that worked on the movie hated working on the movie, even nicknaming it The Abuse. Cameron later said, quote, I knew this was going to be a hard shoot, but even I had no idea just how hard. I don't ever want to go through this again, end quote. Less than a decade later, he'd be making Titanic. So maybe he didn't learn his lesson. For Rocky IV, Sylvester Stallone decided that he wanted Dolph Lundgren to fight him for real. This guy, Ivan Drago. Stallone wanted this guy to really lay into him. The one thing we can say about Stallone's injury is that it was entirely self-inflicted. After all, he was the director. 
in order to provide some realism to the fight, Stallone told Lundgren to quote, just go out there and try to clock me. For the first minute of the fight, it is going to be a free-for-all, end quote. Well, it wasn't as though Lundgren could say no to his director. He lay into Stallone, who felt alright after the fight but started having trouble breathing later that night. It got to be so bad that Stallone had to be put up in the ICU for 9 days. In Stallone's words, quote, What had happened is he struck me so hard in the chest that my heart slammed against my breastbone and began to swell. So the beating became labored and without medical attention, the heart would have continued to swell until it stopped, end quote. He compared it to being hit by a bus, which was probably pretty accurate. Maidstone, directed by Norman Mailer, had such an odd, entirely self-inflicted injury that I can't help but include it. Criterion described the movie as being, quote, a booze-fueled, increasingly hectic five-day shoot in East Hampton, end quote, so you know it's going to be wild. Mailer played Norman T. Kingsley, a film director that wants to be president and has to contend with assassination attempts. One of those attempts was by Rip Torn. Torn, who was asked about the film in an interview, said, quote, it's about assassination. Norman asked several people to set up phony assassination attempts. I think they just didn't follow through, end quote. Keep in mind that this movie is not from 2024, but it is from 1970, when assassinations, both successful and unsuccessful, were something that Americans had dealt with several times already. Torn's attempt occurs in chapter 12, the final chapter of the movie. He attacked Mailer with a hammer, a real hammer, sink. You must die. You must die. You must die. Not Mailer. Not Mailer. I don't want to kill Mailer, but I must kill Kingsley. In this the hammer opened up Mailer's head as one of the actresses would scream. For his part, Mailer retaliated by trying to bite Torn's ear off with his teeth. At one point, Torn also tries to choke Mailer. The entire fight would find its way into the movie. 1981's Roar is the only movie Noel Marshall ever directed, and it has one of the wildest production stories of any movie ever. As many as 100 people, including cast, crew, and the director himself, suffered injuries at the claws and jaws of many of the untrained animals on set. The movie is about a family that visits Hank, the husband and father, who studies big cats on a Tanzanian nature preserve. He's due to pick them up at the airport, but gets delayed, and they arrive by themselves, wearing hijinks in suit. This is how Complex Magazine described the movie, quote, like watching a live-action Lion King as Mufasa holds a switchblade to your throat, end quote. Of all the people that got hurt on set, Marshall by far had it the worst. There's no complicated reasoning here. The man was an amateur dealing with animals that could easily tear him apart. Marshall would end up suffering around a dozen bites during production. He also probably got bit more times during the years he was caring for the animals. There are two incidents that could have done him in though. The first was a mauling to his face and chest, after which he developed blood poisoning. The second was after another round of maulings. He had to be hospitalized where it turned out that he had developed gangrene, which, quote, is a dangerous and potentially fatal condition that happens when the blood flow to a large area of tissue is cut off, end quote. It would take him years to fully recover. That was just what happened to Marshall, though. Here's a short rundown of what else happened. Bear in mind that this is not an exhaustive list. 1. Lead actress, Tippi Hedren, who was once attacked by real birds that nearly gouged her eye out while filming Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, was bitten in the head by a lion. The teeth brushed her skull. Later, she had her ankle fractured because an elephant bucked her off her back. She also got scratched by a leopard and bitten by a cougar. 2. Her daughter, Melanie Griffith, needed facial reconstructive surgery after getting mauled by a lioness. The injury needed 50 stitches and she, like her mother years before, almost lost an eye. Her daughter, Dakota Johnson, has yet to have such an incident, but considering what happened to her mother and grandmother, the odds probably aren't in her favor. 3. Cinematographer John DeBond, who later did Speed and Twisters, was scalped by a lion. He needed 220 stitches. He later said that Roar, quote, is the only picture I almost lost my head over, end quote. Amusingly, the movie he did right after Roar was Cujo, a movie about a killer dog. 4. A.D. Doran Cowper suffered injuries to the throat, jaw, and ear, scalp, chest, and thigh. He needed to undergo a four and a half hour surgery to save his life. This might have been worse than what happened with Marshall, but it's a toss up. 5. No Marshall's son, John Marshall, was bit in the head by a lion. He needed more than 50 stitches. And 6. His other son, Jerry Marshall, merely suffered a bite on the foot while wearing shoes. In the grand scheme of the movie, he got off scot free. Also, despite premiering in 1981, the movie only got a North American release in 2015. All this pain and suffering for a box office flop. It's worth noting that the animal attacks were just one of the pain points in making Roar. The movie had floods, fires, disease, and more. Tippi Hedren said best, quote, It's amazing no one was killed, end quote. 
Making movies can sometimes be a long, painful endeavor, and sometimes that pain stays with you for the rest of your life. It's amazing that no one was killed as a result of these productions. A few of these movies are some of the finest ever made, while some others have been long forgotten. Nonetheless, they will remain historic for the sheer hell that they put their actors through.